This is the moderator. This meeting is now back in session. This meeting is being recorded. Could we uh, please take the roll one more time since we took a break? Sir Matt? I'm present. I'm present. You, Farrow? Present. Heidelbeck? Present. Thank you. Lynch? Here. Nevdal? Here. Heck? Here. Ron? Stevenson? Here. Thank you. Wolsey? Here. Thank you. Wu? Here. And you? Here. Thank you. Quorum established. Thank you all. Um, at this point, we will move on to agenda item two, which is the review and approval of the minutes from August 21st and August uh, August 20th and August 21st. If you recall, there were some modifications requested, and those were done. And then our our committee member minutes from September 24th and 25th. Can I have any um, committee members make any notes that they believe that there's changes that needed or a motion for approval? This is committee member Nevidal. I will make a motion to approve um, the meeting minutes from August 20th, 21st, 24th, and 25th. Do we have a second? Committee member Cermak, I second. Now, just for clarification, um, the 24th and 25th were for September meetings. Uh, can we clarify that that was the intent of the motion? Um, the intent of the motion was to capture the updated meetings from the meeting minutes from August, as well as the 24th and 25th of September. So there's three, um, excuse me, three sets of meeting minutes that are included in this motion. I believe there's four. I think there's uh, one for each of the 20th, 21st, 24th, and 25th. Um, is it, did you not get the fourth packet, Ms. Nevada? Um, I did not see those online, no. I saw the revised 80 minutes for August 21st, and then both. Okay days of meeting minutes for September. And I believe that that is what is in our packet. One moment, clarification from our, there were no changes to the minutes of the 20th, which were pre-approved at the last meeting. The request for changes was from the 21st, is that correct? Believe you're right, Ms. Nevidal, but we are verifying the minutes from the last. Very good. So can you just include them all in the motion since they are on the agenda item that uh, you're making a recommendation for August 20th, 21st, September 21st, 
24th, 25th of 2020. Uh, very well, this is committee member Nevidal, and I um, make a motion that we um, accept or approve um, meeting minutes from August 2021, as well as September 24 and 25. And can we get our second to uh, approve the uh, modified motion? Sir Mac, I agree. Thank you. Uh, discussion, do we want? Can we open this up for discussion from the public? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel. If you would like to make a public comment regarding agenda item number two, the approval of meeting minutes, please click on the Q&A icon at the lower right hand corner of your screen and type, I would like to make a public comment. All comments will be entered or addressed in the order received. I will now pause a moment to allow individuals time to access this feature. At this time, we've received no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Please do. Feature has been closed. And we take the roll on the. Thermac. Aye. Farrow? Aye. Heidelberg? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Peck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. And you? Aye. Motion passes. Very good. So moving on to the next agenda item, which was agenda item three, a presentation on recommendations related to and addressing the challenges and opportunities to, ex uh, to maintaining, expanding, and supporting a diverse, equitable, and inclusive regulated uh, legal regulated cannabis marketplace for communities, consumers, workers, and owners. I regret to inform everybody who may have got online to see that presentation that the current um, president of a United Core Alliance was on the agenda to do the presentation, had a medical emergency and was unable to be here today to do the presentation. As a result, we are going to be moving this at the next um, uh, we'll be looking at getting it either on the next agenda or the agenda following the first agenda of next year. So uh, with that, we're going to move on to agenda item number four, which is the presentation on metric track and trace system, metric 2020 system enhancements and the future of the California Cannabis Track and Trace CCTT API for third party integrators. With that, we're going to invite um, our presenters, which is the Department of uh, Food and Agriculture for California. Uh, thank you very much and please open the presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Farrow and committee members. This is Richard Parrott. I'm the director of the Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing Division with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. The Department of Food and Agriculture is the agency that oversees the contract for the state track and trace system. We work in partnership with the Bureau of Cannabis Control and the Manufactured Cannabis Safety Branch within the California Department of Public Health for the administration of this system. Since our go live date and the initial onboarding of state licensees into the metric track and trace system, all licensing authorities and metric have been working to ensure that the system meets the needs of a wide variety of stakeholders. In the past year, Metric has been pursuing a variety of system enhancements specifically targeted to improve system stability, responsiveness, and performance, in addition to regular defect fixes and quality of life improvements 
for users of both the metric web application and the application programming interface, also known as the API. In addition, strategies for more effective coordination and collaboration between California's licensing authorities, industry users, and metric are in development. And joining us to, to provide a report on these efforts is Metrics Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Lewis Koski. And I'll turn it over to Lewis next. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you also to uh, Lori and Rasha and to the committee members uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here today to uh, discuss the, the details of this report. Again, I'm Lewis Koski. I'm a Chief Operating Officer of Metric. Uh, I've been working uh, uh, in cannabis policy for a little over 10 years now, and I've been with Metric for a little bit over uh, a year and a half now, and I'm really proud to be here uh, representing the company. I'm also really looking forward to sharing uh, with you everything we've been working on this year. Um, I think it would be a understatement uh, uh, by any means to say that 2020 has been a, a unique and challenging year for uh, all of us. Uh, a lot of what we've been working on in the system are things that we planned for 2020, uh, while other things are things that we expedited due to uh, some unforeseen circumstances in the system. And then there's other things that uh, we we uh, uh, included and in, in front loaded into our priorities this year due to some things that that changed uh, um, towards the, the later spring months of the year. So we had some challenges uh, during the year. We've also had some successes. Uh, we know that uh, that the the challenges and successes impact are the challenges and the and the, th the successes that we have impact many of you uh, and the others and so to good and bad I, I want to discuss uh, both of those uh, with you today um, uh, both on the positive and the negative side so um, the the balance of of my presentation is really focused on the two things that that Richard talked about which is the um, enhancements that we've been working on for for 2020. And then I'm going to spend um, uh, a fair amount of time towards the end of the presentation talking about uh, the future of the CCTT application uh, programming interface, uh, which I'm going to refer to uh, going forward as, uh, as our, our API. So the first slide uh, that I have here uh, gives you an insight, some insight into the amount of traffic, total traffic that we've seen in the system. So this uh, includes uh, 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 traffic that moves through the API. It includes traffic um, that is uh, uh, begins at the uh, at the uh, in, in using metric proper. So if you're um, in metric and you're creating a package that creates traffic in the system, if you're creating a manifest that creates traffic in the system. Um, third party integrators. Uh, move information and data through the API. All of that, uh, every layer of the system is included in this um, particular uh, table. You know, and a common question that we get, um, and I'm sure all of you are are getting the same question, is is what what challenges um, are you facing as a result of the pandemic? And and for the most part, I, I would I would say that we've really been counting our our blessings largely. Think. Think uh, uh, um, appreciative to the fact that the cannabis industry has been uh, um, uh, systematically deemed essential across the the country and in California. Um, so we so we we are counting our blessings, and as as we were coming through the uh, February, March, April months, and um, we were really starting to recognize the the challenges that might be coming about from uh, COVID. Uh, we we were focused on three things. Uh, the first one was to, to keep our employees safe uh, and, and to make sure that we had safe working environment for them, um, followed in close proximity and a parallel path to ensuring that uh, the essential business functions that, that impact uh, users in the system uh, were maintained and, and, and kept secure. And of course, monitoring for unanticipated system uh, issues that might be related to the pandemic. And, what this slide shows is all that data going through the system. And if you lay that over the kind of the key months of, uh, of work from home and uh, um, uh, restrictions on going out into the public and thing, are, are, as, that, as those items were ramping up, so was uh, um, the traffic in our system. And so with system use like this, you have to be primarily focused on maintaining and proving performance. 
uh, without question, without question, this was an extraordinary amount of system use. Um, so our response was focused on better understanding why this was happening, uh, assessing the problems that, that could be created by this and dedicating ourselves to uh, countering those problems. Now, for the most part, I've, I've uh, uh, um, uh, kind of attributed a lot of this to uh, pandemic, but you know, we also know that there was uh, an increase in commerce during the same period of time where you see the uptick in system usage. Um, we also know that this is just a busy time of year, uh, March through uh, um, August and September, those summer months with 420 and the holidays. It's a busy time of year. Um, the difference here is, is, is that um, this was so out of norm from previous years that we knew that those um, busy times weren't accounting for uh, all of the traffic. So without question, uh, the challenges from COVID uh, were shaping the way uh, we were looking at what we were going to do in the system from the early months of the year, or, uh, uh, February, March, coming into spring and late spring, we were really looking at those and those were really starting to have a lot of influence on, on how we were going to prioritize. And, and as a result of that, we were been a pri prioritizing a lot of things related to performance of the system, security of the system, stabilizing um, some of the challenges that come from this amount of traffic and identifying what, if anything, we could do to slow it down because this kind of exponential increase in traffic is bound to uh, create some, some performance issues. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, um, uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the enhancements that we've done so far uh, and uh, some of the things that we've done just are kind of normal quality of life type of things in the system, along with some of those system enhancements that we've done. So um, enhancements really fall into three categories. It's the software enhancements that we make, which is what all the users experience when they log into metric and they're uh, inputting inventory or reviewing inventory data that's in the system, their services, whether that's um, uh, from the support side or training or updating uh, manuals. And, and then there's other things that we do um, to the system. Uh, and, and that can be any number of different things too. And I'll talk about all of those. So um, just to put it in perspective, uh, in California, in the production environment, we've done uh, 86 uh, enhancements to the production version of metric in California. And we've done a, an additional 64 bug fixes. Bug fixes come in from a number of different sources, uh, but we've worked on and completed 64 of those where the fix is now in production and users are able to uh, um, uh, take advantage of those changes. You know, another example of an enhancement that I think is important is, is ones that come from uh, changes to public policy that may be unique to, to California. One example of this is the uh, donation functionality that we completed uh, in, in late spring uh, coming into the uh, to summer months. Uh, some things that we did on the documentation and training side um, is uh, um, uh, updates to our CSV formatting guide, which is the alternative to using the API. So you can use a C CSV document uh, to move data in between other systems that you use as a cannabis business um, and put that into metric and vice versa from metric back into those other systems. We did some updates to the CCTT user guide. Keeping that up to date is uh, no easy task, especially when you look at the new development, uh, at least the number of items that we develop on a given year. Uh, we also added some cultivation training, uh, the advanced cultivation training in California. So cultivators can now log in and, and uh, uh, sign up for uh, advanced cultivation training. And then the last thing and probably more recently is we just published uh, a number of YouTube training videos. And these, these training videos are not California specific, but they cover basic functionality in the system that's applicable to most, uh, if not all the jurisdictions that we're in right now. And that'll give you kind of an idea of some of the work that we're planning for future training and the, the quality and the time um, uh, that's going into uh, that training and, uh, and in particular uh, training that might be more specific to California. Um, so those are those are kind of just a, a high level view of some of those uh, enhancements that we did to the system that are probably the type of things that a user that gets into the system every day um, would notice. Um, the the ones related to system performance are things that uh, someone gets in the system every day may or may not notice. Um, the first one 
um, uh, which is significant, is query optimization. Um, uh, and what this did is this refreshed all the queries that the system uses to respond to information people ask when they're in the system. Um, there's also a number of queries that run in the back end of the system through the API and the, and the web layer of the system. Uh, but the query optimization component that's probably most applicable to Canvas businesses is the, is the queries related to packages. Um, earlier in the year this year, we were having some uh, timing issues with um, loading packages into manifests, and it was taking uh, considerable time. There's a number of reasons for that, one of which was um, uh, some of our uh, the queries that run in the background of the system really needed to be updated and refreshed because as you do more and more development work uh, in the system, some of those queries become less and less efficient. So um, uh, to kind of put this into perspective, a lot of the functionality related to packages, um, uh, thanks to query optimization, is running about six times faster than it was um, towards the earlier part of the year. Uh, thanks to uh, the, the query optimization. Um, the next one is data optimization. This one's not quite ready for production in California yet, but what this does is it takes all the data that used to be in an active table related to sales receipts, um, and it takes the older data or the data that's completed and moves it into an active table. So what that does is, as, as, uh, as a user in the system is querying sales receipt data, um, they're only um, like the day-to-day -day, um, work that happens in the system and they're querying sales receipt data. They're only um, querying a, a smaller set of data um, that is active in what they need. And it's not um, uh, uh, looking back at data all the way back, you know, a year or two or even longer in some states. And so it just makes that that particular um, area of running the, the system much more efficient. Um, so data optimization is something that is uh, on our product roadmap, California, um, and we anticipate um, having it ready for a production release and, and, the, uh, and to be switched on in the next uh, uh, um, couple of months, provided that uh, um, we get everything coordinated on our end with uh, um, uh, California and the licensing authorities to make sure that uh, that we're ready for that. So that's a kind of a future release coming down, down the pike. Um, I mentioned um, uh, in the previous slide, just talking about all of the data flow that's uh, coming into the system. Um, and when we see that much traffic in the system, uh, one of the uh, preliminary or more immediate responses is to add system resources. Um, and as we were seeing an enhanced traffic in the system, at some point that uses data and at some point you just run out of, of uh, resources. So as we were uh, seeing that happen, we were um, expediting the number of resources uh, and doubling and tripling sometimes the number of resources we had planned for for California. Uh, we did that by adding in new uh, servers into the system. Uh, we enhanced our memory and we did a number of system configurations to, to try and balance out the load. And, and what you'll find later is, well, well that is, is certainly helpful in the short run uh, when traffic is doubling uh, and sometimes more than tripling in a few month period of time. Um, system resources is a good way to um, slow things down a little bit, but it's not a long term solution um, if that uh, amount of data is is like a, a runaway train. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go. So. Um, uh, this year has not been without um, some performance related challenges due to traffic in the system. And so what this slide represents is the total number of per performance related support tickets uh, for the states outlined here. California's support tickets are included uh, in, the, in the number in the green bars, but the yellow line represents how many of those uh, were uh, support tickets from California. And again, these are support tickets specifically related to licensees calling in and reporting some form of, of, uh, of uh, um, performance issue in metric or, or through uh, their third party integrator. Uh, and so if you look at this slide, you'll see that April um, and September were two of the uh, worst months for California in terms of number of performance related tickets. 
Um, and most of those performance related tickets were um, uh, also related to days in which we were having uh, excessive use um, of the API uh, bandwidth, uh, which then in turn uh, created performance issues for licensees using third party integrators, in some cases, uh, um, licensees who were not using third party integrators. Um, uh, the the um, uh, just when they were using metric and the, the user interface. Uh, so again, to just the, the problem here uh, that that we were facing is that just adding the resources into the ar architecture is not enough. So we can get a short term fix, like you see from June to July, but to be able to maintain that um, that fix, um, you have to be able uh, to to have other uh, um, uh, solutions that you're ready to implement. So, um, the, uh, as we're getting significant increases in performance related tickets, you know, we were able to better diagnose the problem, but it didn't mean that that wasn't creating some slowdowns and, uh, some hectic times for licensees on their end. Uh, so, uh, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, uh, as I get forward, but as we saw the tickets in May and June, uh, increase dramatically. And by the way, most of those tickets uh, for May and June were in two or three other states um, that, that we uh, service. Most of them were states that have had um, metric for some time and their data set uh, is amongst the larger data sets that we have in their respective instances of metric. Um, so we added resources that was immediate. The other thing that we did that I haven't talked about yet is um, we started to do outreach to third party integrators. And the reason why we started that outreach is, is we reviewed our our API logs, which is the um, the logs that indicate how much traffic is coming through the API. We were identifying a number of third party integrators um, that were making a lot more calls um, into the API and, 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 and not just um, a couple hundred more calls, but literally sometimes millions of calls a day more than what they were doing uh, previously. And so we were identifying that quickly, identifying that as a way of, or as a possible cause for some of the slowdown in the metric system. Um, so we started some outreach with the TPIs and I'll talk, or the third party integrators, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also did that optimization work, the optimization work that I talked about earlier um, helps with um, some of the performance related issues, especially within metric proper, uh, because the system is just operating more efficiently. And then we started working on a rate limiting plan. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about rate limiting and what it is and, and what our, our strategy was for that. But that was our uh, a midterm solution. And then the other one was uh, to, uh, to uh, extend the outreach we were uh, doing with third party integrators individually uh, and start a focus group with third party integrators um, to better understand what requests they had in the system. So if we were gonna uh, compel rate limiting, um, they could uh, also uh, advance some ideas on how we could change our system to help make them more efficient as well. So it was kind of the beginning of what I would consider to be a, uh, a, a strong partnership that's yielded some great results uh, in the last couple of months. So. So for the balance of this talk, I'm going to kind of shift away from the, the 2020 component of, uh, of uh, what we've done in the system and focus a little bit more on the CCTT uh, API. All right. All right. I mentioned earlier, simply adding resources to the architecture of the system helps and is necessary over time, but it doesn't necessarily um, fix the problem over the long term, especially when we're seeing growth like we've never seen before. Whatever we put in to uh, improve the architecture of the system, it was quickly getting consumed. So um, uh, uh, the, drop in, um, the drop in tickets I mentioned earlier from June, July certainly has uh, uh, is attributable to adding resources to the system, um, but also there was a lot of work that we did one-on-one -on -one with third-party integrators during that period of time um, to help them start making their integrations more efficient. And, and, I, and I have to say, I've kind of mentioned this already, that we didn't see and even think for one moment that there was anything deliberately being done uh, to harm the metric system by the third party integrator uh, community. In fact, it was quite the opposite. We all have an interest in making sure that the experience that the cannabis businesses and the regulators experience within the system um, is a positive one. So since we had a mutual interest, 
um, it was really helpful to, to start working with them a lot more uh, closely. Um, so first of all, I want to talk, uh, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about rate limiting because I, I know it can get a little get, bit confusing, but then I'll talk a little bit more about uh, outreach. So the red line in this slide uh, represents what we were expecting to see in terms of system usage uh, and, uh, uh, and growth in 2020. So this slide should look very familiar. It's the exact same uh, lead off slide that I had earlier. It's just got a fancy red line I dropped in there. Um, everything north of the red line is attributable to an increase in commerce and some of the other um, activity that we expected for summer, uh, but only a small part of that really attributes to that, that those blocks above the red line. Um, a large portion of that was exponentially more API use um, that would have been way beyond uh, what uh, the system or, or the, the third party integrators should need. Um, in fact, you know, it's kind of it's kind of put rate limiting into perspective. Our system usage slide is almost identical to the demand curve for toilet paper during the same time. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, March and April and May and June, it was harder than anything to uh, buy toilet paper. In fact, stores uh, were experiencing huge increases um, in the demand for toilet paper at the same time we were experiencing a uh, huge demand for system resources. Um, and uh, stores couldn't keep uh, the toilet paper on their shelves in the early days of the pandemic because people were coming in and filling up shopping carts. And um, uh, and, and, and as soon as uh, toilet paper would make it onto the shelf, people would come in uh, and take the toilet paper off. And it was really difficult to, to find at the time. In fact, they couldn't keep their shelf stocked uh, until they decided to start putting some limit on the amount of toilet paper that people could buy uh, and keep uh, on their shelves. In a lot of ways, rate limiting uh, is similar to that in so much that um, the uh, uh, system was experiencing use like we'd never experienced before. Um, and it was really difficult to tell um, at what point it was going to peak and the more resources we added, the more they were used. So we started working with third-party integrators to make their integrations more efficient, but to galvanize those, those changes that we achieved with third-party integrators we needed to implement rate limiting to secure it over the, uh, the, the long haul. So in, in our system, third party integrators communicate on behalf of licensees through the metric API. In most cases, if the traffic got heavy in the API, uh, there would be slowdowns for the third party integrator and the licensees using third party integrators, but usually not the people that use metric directly. Um, this was different, licensees using uh, uh, the system were also impacted at sometimes uh, with reported delays in the system, even though that they weren't they weren't using uh, third party integrators. So this was um, uh, definitely different than anything that we had expected uh, before. So we uh, decided that, and working with the third party integrated community, and also working very closely with the state, that we we're going to start moving towards a rate limit where we could slowly. Uh, um, work with the third party integrators to have more disciplined integrations in through the API. So the first um, uh, the first rate limit um, is uh, is designed to be more toilet paper than you could possibly use uh, in a couple of months worth of time. Um, and so it's intended to be very generous um, so that we could have some success with it um, and then uh, start to make it more disciplined um, over time. So um, the rate limiting with uh, increases in resources, data optimization, and uh, and close working relationship with the third party integrators, we thought that that would help to uh, start to uh, um, change the patterns we were seeing in the system. So, um, uh, to kind of uh, show what kind of success we had, um, before we ever even turned on rate limiting in California, we worked with integrators starting in July. Um, all the way down to October um, uh, the, in, the, in the recent weeks, we still continue to work with them. And what you can see here is, is that in July, um, third party integrators made 211.5 million calls into the API that would be subject to rate limiting, 211.5 million calls. This is just California. Um, and then from July to August, um, as we started working with the third party integrators, we saw that drop by uh, uh, several million down to 187.4 million. And by the time we got to late September coming into October, that number had dropped by over 10 times to 16.3 million. 
Um, and if you remember from uh, the, um, the slide on performance related calls um, in October so far this year, we still have two more days. So this 13.5 million is going to go up, but it's dropped again down to 13.5 million. So we think that normal use, at least for California, and it's gonna grow um, as more third party integrators come on board. Um, we think that this is closer to what the traffic should be in the system uh, compared to what, what we saw by July and August. So I guess I, I can't um, emphasize enough um, how important it was uh, for the state uh, and metric and the third party integrator community in California to get together um, and work really hard towards a solution. Um, uh, and this slide really demonstrates um, uh, um, how successful we were in that respect. Kind of the, to, uh, to build on that a little bit, if we actually look at the first rate limit, which by the way, the first rate limit was turned on October 12th, um, and we monitored it to the 27th for the purposes uh, of this. We actually look at it every day. But in that 16 day period, um, um, uh, only 0.16 of 1% of API calls were limited. So we actually had days where there were zero calls that were limited in the system because of the work uh, we did together. Uh, that number was really low. And also, you know, somewhat predictably, this number was intended, this first round was intended to be uh, a way of easing into more discipline rate limits over time. So somewhat predictably, we didn't expect to have a lot, um, but I can tell you just over time, those numbers went down and, and here's where we are today. So 1.3% uh, cent of integrators on a daily basis um, are subjected to some form of limited call. The most we've ever had in a day right now is 421 calls. Um, and then 0.06% of licensees have been impacted, assuming that about a third uh, of the licensees use a third party integrator. If that number were actually larger than that, then this percentage would, would go down. So um, these numbers are very uh, positive in terms of the rate limit. The other thing I would just think is important to, to say again is, is as of this morning, uh, um, when I was preparing uh, uh, my final uh, thoughts for this presentation, we were sitting at zero performance related calls from licensees. And so I think um, that's a, a, a pretty good testament to what we're doing. We're also seeing, you know, in September, we saw a drop in, uh, of uh, 48 terabytes uh, since the peak in July. So that's great. Rate limit one is working well. Um, I think it's pretty efficient. Uh, we haven't had uh, too many um, uh, in our conversations with third party integrators, too many concerns expressed. Now, um, we're monitoring for rate limit two. So rate limit two is something that we can do in you know, a month or so down the road, depending upon uh, where we stand. Um, but this is what we're learning from monitoring uh, the data in the system. So we already know what rate limit two is scheduled to be. We just haven't scheduled when it's gonna be turned on. And since we know what it's gonna be, we can monitor it in the system to see how many calls would be limited if we turned it on. So um, this is an early detection uh, mechanism that we built into the system. So when we see that integrators are struggling or having a hard time, we can identify who they are, when they're having the problems um, and data related to what they were doing at the time so we can help them improve and make their integrations more efficient. So the first number you see here is 15.3% of calls. That's too many for us to turn on rate limit two. Um, the, um, uh, um, so 15.3% of the calls, if we turned on rate limit two, would likely get flagged on a, on a daily basis. And that would impact about 5% of the integrators. Um, and about 3.3% of the licensing licenses, again, assuming that about a third of the licensees use uh, a third party integrator that operates through the API. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about this because even though that 15.3% is a number on its face that's really concerning, the more positive number is that 5% of integrators um, are impacted and in fact, of the top four third party integrators with um, flagged calls for limitations, uh, they account for about 98% of the total flagged calls. And so just real quick too, so you know, there's about 150 to 120 third party integrators that are active in the API on a monthly basis. And we've issued keys, I believe for 296, so just under 300. So less than half of the integrators that have keys are on a monthly basis using the API. So we expect that to grow. We expect 
more third-party integrators to come on board. We expect more licensees to come on board. So continuing on with this rate limiting is very, very important. So, um, but my point to you is as it stands right now, four of the third-party integrators out of that 115 to 120 um, uh, a month that are active in the system, they account for 98% of the total flagged cost. So our outreach now um, specific to rate to uh, rate limit to monitoring uh, is going to be really heavily focused with those four third party integrators, but the others that are also having some challenges so we can get those numbers to sound a little closer to where we are currently um, with rate limit number one. And then we'll see how this goes and then we'll start talking a little bit more about monitoring for the final rate limit three uh, to make sure that we're doing this in a responsible way and impacting licensees minimally. So one more slide here and then uh, I'm, I'm getting ready for questions. Um, so rate limiting is something that we've asked of third party integrators, as I mentioned to you before um, that we, we formed a third party integrator um, focus group. Um, and while that's been very helpful and we intend on, on continuing to, to grow that group, we're also looking to get more feedback from other third party integrators. Um, so we're looking at exploring software like a, a one called user voice where third party integrators can go in and vote um, on things that they wanna see prioritized in the system. Um, but this was some preliminary work that we did with the focus group where we um, identified in talking to them individually, all these different things that they would like to see done in the, the, the API. Um, and then we, we surveyed them all uh, to, uh, and asked them to prioritize them. And this is what they, they came up with. The reason why uh, idempotent transactions is highlighted in blue on this a particular graph is because um, that's already been um, uh, developed um, and launched in uh, our last production release into California. So third party integrators are already able to take advantage uh, of that particular one. I can explain what that is if, uh, if you have a question about it. Um, but some of these things are, are things that we feel like we need to do as part of our contractual obligations and providing a robust and, and uh, powerful API. Some of these things are kind of nice to haves for the, the third party integrator community that would make them more efficient. So we're gonna continue to have those conversations. In fact, as we've had more conversations since this graph was created, um, we've actually identified uh, close to 80 things, 80, 80 um, items that we're currently evaluating uh, internally um, to help prioritize, keeping in mind that uh, the requests that, that come from third party integrators are important. They're an incredibly important stakeholder group um, and, and, and part of the uh, regulatory um, uh, universe. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're doing as much as we can to help work through some of the needs that they have. But we also have to keep in mind um, that, that, that uh, we have other priorities that we're working on um, that come to us from, uh, uh, from the state and, and from other things coming in from uh, support uh, and, and those types of items. So um, those were the slides uh, um, that I wanted to share with you and kind of give you the uh, 2020 update. I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, turn it over to whoever the best person is uh, in case there's uh, questions for me from the, from the committee. Thank you very much, Lewis. Richard? Do you have any comments you'd like to make? Um, uh, thank you, Chair Farrow. I don't at this time. I just want to uh, thank Lewis for giving us that walkthrough. Um, and as Lewis said, he's available for questions, and I am as well, and we'll stand by for um, any questions from the committee. Thank you. Very good. Again, thank you very much for a very thorough presentation. Committee members, do you have any questions you'd like to present to either Richard or Lewis? Committee Member Neptal, I see your hand is raised. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Um, this is Committee Member Neptal. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and it seems that there is a lot of communication between um, metric and the API individuals. But um, what about the individual users, so the businesses that are mandated to utilize metric? Um, it seems that there's been some challenges um, and with functionality and questions and suggestions perhaps that um, operators have and is there a pathway available for them to also participate in a stakeholder um, feedback opportunity with metric directly thank you um uh kristen this is richard parrott um i'll i'll take that one for a response um yes we are in the process um of setting up a pathway for a user feedback group um, 
So we've received a, a couple of inquiries from some industry groups, um, and I'm working with uh, Metric, with our sister agencies, with Bureau of Cannabis Control and uh, Department of Public Health. And we will be getting um, uh, an initial meeting set up very soon um, and talking about how we uh, put this user group together. Um, we started with um, the uh, third party vendors. There were, um, uh, you know, a lot of issues that were brought forward about the um, uh, the, the system traffic. Um, that's what Lewis was presenting on today, but we are aware that there are um, user um, uh, conversations we need to have with the users. So um, we will be setting that up. And thank you for, for asking that question. Do we have any other questions for Lewis? Yes. And who is that? Oh, um, committee member Stevenson. Thank you, committee member, committee member Stevenson speaking. Um, back in the end of May, late May, we sustained a burglary and we sustained two burglaries and the insurer requested that we provide uh, copies of all of the products that were taken. And when, and when I went into metric, metric did not retain the information in a format that was, that's two things. They didn't retain it. Metric did not retain the information and it did not retain it in a, in the requested format. I can't re recall what the requested format was. However, I was, I was pretty displeased that metric didn't retain the information. However, the uh, point of sale system that we do use, which I will not name, provided the information. I will say that metric support staff was very hands-on, but, their, but they were, their hands were tied as the system could not provide the requested information. So as I look at the upsurge in tickets in May and June, uh, to me that could be presumed or assumed that it was due to the many uh, cannabis thefts for slash burglaries that happened in the months of uh, May and June. So that's what I heard as, as an operator, and I want to share that there's much more work that metric needs to do to the system in order to please operators. And California being the largest operator in the state, you know, I don't feel like they have the necessary technological infrastructure to take on the task. Thank you. Very good. I don't know if there was a, a response um, expected from your comments, Mr. Or committee member Richardson. Um, I do know in our last meeting, this is committee member Farrell, Chair Farrell, there was some conversation about the uniqueness of the state of California related to the fires that we've been having. There were questions about um, certain areas where cell connectivity was challenging uh, regularly, but more challenging when there were rolling blackouts and power outages, uh, when there were wind events or other events that made doing instant uploading into the system difficult. If I remember some of the committee members and some of the public comments had to do with, was there a way with metric in which you could post required data when there wasn't cellular conductivity and have it create a timestamp so that way they reported timely and not have to shut down their business, but would 
automatically upload with the original input at the time of connectivity taking place. Can't hear anything. Is that something that metric is looking at? I'm gonna... Richard, is it okay if I respond to that? Yes, Lewis, um, and and I could just say, Jeff, uh, Chair Farrow, I um, we noted that as a a, um, a discussion from that that previous advisory committee meeting. Um, I think that was a recommendation that came forward and is on our um, on our list that we had captured. And then I'll let Lewis respond. Thanks, uh, Richard, and, and thank you, Chair Farrow. I, uh, uh, Louis Koski here again. Um, it's certainly something we we would think about. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we're currently uh, uh, planning anything for that. It would be something that we would have to incorporate if there was uh, a uh, regulatory or legislative requirement. Uh, the way that our system is designed is as a SaaS model. Uh, and it's so convenience of use. So you can use it from your phone, you can use it from your computer. Um, a lot of software companies are, are going to that SaaS model, um, which uh, um, has a lot of benefits. One of the, the challenges for it is the offline use. And one of the reasons why it's challenging for offline use is you don't download something to your computer. Um, you operate it completely off of the web. Um, so in, in, in thinking through some of that, obviously there's some regulatory decisions that need to be made that would uh, influence uh, our thinking more than, than anything. But um, I think the, the important thing to keep in mind is that there would also be some pretty significant technical challenges, not necessarily things that couldn't be uh, um, overcome, but uh, it, th there would be challenges nonetheless. Thank you for that. Uh are there any additional questions from committee member? I see committee member Nevidal's hand raised. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, this is committee member Nevidal. So just to um, briefly expand on the issues with connectivity, um, there are lots of operators in very remote and rural areas of California where there is no broadband, very low and spotty cellular service. And while they sometimes have access to metric, um, the connectivity speed is such that um, there's a lot of spinning wheel action, so to speak. So it's kind of renders the system unusable. Um, and it just folks don't have the ability to wait and wait and wait and wait for loading. Um, and so this is, I think, part of the um, core request around making sure that there's some sort of um, desktop version, perhaps, right, that allows you to download the information and the program onto your desktop and then upload as connectivity um, allows. But I, I just wanted to point that out. And that could also be why you see increases in um, um, questions or tickets to metric because, you know, folks can't just stand and wait for the spinning wheel to stop when you're in a remote area with no broadband, no cable internet, you're solely on satellite and potentially a hotspot. But, you know, I live in Garberville and I've had in the past month, two full days where I have zero cell service in town. So, and even the small towns don't have broadband in a lot of these rural locations. So um, it, it is a, a unique issue maybe to California. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you for your comments, committee member Nevidal. Um, I see no other committee member hands up at the moment. Any other committee members? Uh, moderator, could you please open this section up for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon located in the lower right portion of your screen and type, I would like to make a public comment. I will pause a moment to allow you an opportunity to access this feature.
So it does appear we have several requests for public comment. First, I want to make a small announcement that each public comment will be given a minute and a half and provided a 30 second warning. Once your time has been reached, your microphone will once again be muted. First up, we have an individual identified as Eddie Franco. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, committee members. Uh, my name is Eddie Franco with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Thanks so much for this presentation. Um, our, we have a couple recommendations as it relates to metric. Our first recommendation is we ask that a, a metric specific working group or subcommittee within the CAC be convened, just considering a wide variety of issues that we've been talking about, not only on this uh, meeting, but in subsequent meetings and past meetings. Um, we believe that having this mode for ongoing feedback and stakeholder engagement related to metric um, is really essential and would allow a pathway for more specific uh, metric related recommendations to come forth. Moreover, we also recommend that we modify the existing process for licensees to obtain plan and package tags in a manner that better takes into account the operational decisions of this of that licensee. Um, this also ties to the specific conditions in rural communities as uh, committee member Nembadal was talking about. Um, so overall, would love to see a modification of that process. Thanks so much. Next, our request comes from Darren Story. Your microphone has been unmuted. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your time. Um, I'd like to thank Lewis for his presentation, but committee members, please do not be fooled. At this point, metric is broken and has no chance of ever catching up to California's legal cannabis market. The issues with metric are many, but the most immediate glaring problems are outages. Metric has extraordinarily little bandwidth to support the current amount of California operators. The picture Lewis paints is actually far worse. Although they promised to add servers and improve connectivity, we still experience outages an average of five times daily. These outages mean the limit has been reached and therefore actual demand is actually much higher than Lewis's charts show. There's a massive waste. Our nursery supports many cultivators who grow to scale in efforts to achieve efficient, low-cost, legalized cannabis production. The current CCTT system requires a non-recyclable tag to be associated with every single mature plant. With planting densities as high as 35,000 plants per acre, we've seen a massive amount of waste being generated, which has nowhere else to go but California's landfills. Solutions. For immediate corrective action, California should abolish plant tags now. These plant tags are redundant, unnecessary, costly to the state, and cause thousands of pounds of garbage annually. There's no need to track every single mature plant. We can do it in block and lots and use package tags, just like a commercial agricultural producer and any other com Time had been reached. Our next public comment comes from Jennifer Gairani. Your microphone has been unmuted. This is Jennifer commenting on behalf of the California's Distributors Association, which is leading several industry-wide metric improvement initiatives with CDFA. We are very happy to see that the state and metric are working towards API improvement issues. It is important that the committee members understand why fully functional third party integrations with metric is codified into the business and professions code section 26068. Metric is not intended to be the sole software system that operators use to manage their inventory, transactions and transfers. It's simply not built to do that. That is why we have third party software providers. The intent of the regulation is to ensure functional direct communication between metric and third party softwares. Even with the rate limiting and the improvements presented, those remaining issues outlined in the presentation still represent the continued problem that we will take time to repair. When API communication breaks down as it has been, it collapses the operating process. CDA invites committee members to join us in a metric deep dive to learn more about the challenges operators and integrators are facing with the current metric configurations. Please also review the information in our written comment. It's critical that the context of metric requirements is at the forefront of the discussion around regulatory reform. Thank you. 
Our next public comment comes from David Hua. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, everyone's participation here and the stakeholders team making this work. Uh, Lewis, uh, great presentation. Thank you for making that available. Um, you know, metric was mandated January 16th, 2021. Um, you know, prior to that, we've all went through a series of onboardings and uh, temporary statuses and, and whatnot. Um, it's been a journey. Uh, this year, it's been also a journey. Um, you know, we've had a metric downtime which has resulted in the supply chain stopping at critical parts of uh, the day, as well as critical parts of, um, you know, delivery with, especially with COVID happening. Um, you know, I, I, I am a part of the metric integrator group. Uh, I'm a part of the CDA uh, group as well. And, you know, a lot of this is about improving and keep, keeping transparency Thanks. moving forward. Um, you know, I actually would recommend the committee to get really familiar with metric, uh, especially at the cultivator level uh, on the outdoor side. I mean, we are a state with tremendous scale that has not yet been realized. And, uh, you know, we are fearful that this uh, current status that we have is not scalable to, to meet the needs of, of California. And hopefully in the next consolidation period, we can figure out ways to make the supply chain a little bit more resilient uh, when metric. Time had been reached. Our next public comment comes from Ross Gordon. Your microphone has been unmuted. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ross Gordon. I'm policy director with Humboldt County Growers Alliance. I um, appreciate everyone taking the time to consider this issue this morning. Um, want to second really all of the comments um, that have come from folks previously, especially want to second committee member Nebel's comments um, regarding the challenges of access in rural areas. Um, that's something we hear about frequently, the spinning wheel of death and, and difficulties uploading data into the metric system. And also want to emphasize that this issue of rural access is really not in any way a niche issue in California. Um, between the three Emerald Triangle counties, Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties, which are you know, predominantly rural and sometimes extremely rural areas. Those compose about two thirds of the licensed cannabis farmers in California, about 1,600 or so licensed cannabis farmers. So this is actually the core group of folks who are, who are being asked to use the system, at least on the cultivation side. And so from a technical perspective, I think it's really important to have continued attention to these types of issues and try to find solutions. Um, I would also echo the, the commenter um, who spoke about the Second. issues with getting every plant. Um, it's often an issue at the nursery level, but also at the cultivation level, um, and the notion of, of tracking the perhaps a lot instead. Um, I think that's one of many issues which are really more, you know, possibly on the regulatory side, um, and just hope that there's continued attention to making metric workable and creating a system that will make sense on both the technical side of making sure the technical specs work, and also the regulatory side um, to make sure this is actually functional for businesses. Our next public comment comes from Michael Wheeler. Your microphone has been unmuted. Good morning, committee members. Michael Wheeler, Vice President of Policy Initiatives with Flow Cannabis Company. Uh, really appreciate the presentation today. Thank you for the comments from uh, Richard Parrott. Thank you for the comments uh, uh, that were provided from uh, Metrics uh, representative. Um, to uh, just comment, uh, Thank you, Richard Parrott, for uh, uh, being willing to engage with the users of uh, Metric. I, I think that a user's focus group would be really valuable and help to provide that feedback loop uh, between those who use Metric and, and uh, the state uh, in its management of the Metric contract. Uh, to the committee members, I just wanted to sort of give you a sense of what's on the horizon here. It's really important that we do pay attention to the functionality of Metric and the ability for Metric to grow with this growing cannabis industry. Right now, we're looking at an industry that is about 30% bigger than it was last year. That is uh, the amount of sales and transactions that are occurring. Uh, with this pace, we may actually get to 50% of uh, all cannabis sales in California, the other half being the illicit market. Um, and, and we need metric to grow with us. And we need to grow beyond that once interstate commerce is allowable. And so metric does have some catch up that needs to be done. And I encourage you all to pay attention to this topic and become as familiar as you can with it. Thank you so much.
Our next public comment comes from Zion Sadesi. Your microphone has been unmuted and please, when you're finished with your comment, please lower your hand. Hi, my Hi. name is Zion Tadessa. I'm the CEO and the founder of uh, Shasha Maniland Campus. Um, and I'm uh, the core uh, participant uh, right now. I'm asking for full licensing to do the cultivation, manufacturing, distributing in school. But, you know, I'm just the general uh, uh, concern I have, especially uh, places like metrics and other committees and other uh, uh, people uh, going on in the cannabis industry is that I think the job opportunity I want to see, I would like to see more black people hired, more black people being in the committee, because, you know, that is what we are fighting for to get our people black people into the cannabis job and opportunity. So I, uh, you know, I would like to see co uh, companies like metrics uh, mm -hmm. intentionally uh, training and hiring uh, black people. So when people like me go there that, uh, you know, I, I, it's not that, you know, I'm this and that this is, I would like to see more black people, not in just the, the cultivation in the committee and the making decision and into those metrics companies too. So I just uh, want to uh, put that out. Our next public comment comes from an individual identified as Holly Carter. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, and um, thank you for holding this very um, applicable uh, section to be and allowing for us to get some feedback. Um, my name is Holly. I work with a company called Oxalis Integrative Support Services. We offer direct services and guidance to primarily sun grown cultivators, primarily in the Emerald Triangle. Um, but I want to echo some of what has been already discussed in terms of the functionality and the technical side of things um, being a challenge with people who are have limited bandwidth and access but also limited skill sets. And so we have, um, you know, a little bit of a hot mess right there. And, and then the, my greater concern is actually in how the system has been developed primarily, it seems for monocrop and um, perhaps indoor cultivation styles where we have a large amount of cultivators who um, harvest or process in different methods from a monocrop style. 30 seconds. And, um, the guidance from metric has consistently been anti-regulatory compliant, um, which has caused severe supply chain hiccups for many of our farms. And so I would like, I'm looking forward to seeing that worked out, especially with working group. Thank you. As a reminder for individuals looking to make a public comment, we are only taking comments right now on the presentation. It is not for the presenters or panel members to answer any questions. So please keep that in mind. Our next public comment comes from Cole Johnson. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hi, thank you. This is Cole uh, Johnson representing Blackbird, both as a multi state distribution operator and software integrator. While I appreciate everyone that has taken the time to join this call and provide an open discussion, I am having trouble sitting on a call listening to a multi million dollar state contracted software provider describe how difficult 2020 has been for them. Both operators and integrators have seen spikes this year in traffic as well as too many operational hurdles to count. The data traffic and issues reported by metric are minuscule compared to the number of API calls and data transfer that an actual software company experiences. Operators and integrators are required to provide services to their clients, but a state mandated software that costs the state tens of millions of dollars is currently responsible for breaking down that supply chain regularly throughout California. If metric is unable to scale with these relatively small API and data transfer spikes, how does it plan to scale when the remaining 70% of the market that is currently operating in the black market becomes online and uh, joins the California cannabis market? 
and the rest of the market matures. Metric has a long way to go to scale and the measures that are being taken right now are solely putting duct tape on a much larger problem that needs to be addressed at the core of the issue, not per bug that's reported. Thank you. Sorry, just lost him. Give me a second. It appears you are unmuted. Hi. Max, uh, you are unmuted. Great, I didn't hear it in the first place. Hi, uh, Max McGlonis, um, to provide a few comments. Um, I'd like to echo the previous comments made, specifically uh, appreciating the idea of a track and trace focus group um, and the ability to go and preview some of these changes um, and hear from representatives, both from the APIs as well as individual operators via trade organizations. Uh, additionally, want to emphasize the challenges that downtime has um, with distribution licenses, not being able to distribute, transport, receive, deliver cannabis while the metric API while metric is down and the Im major impacts that has. Lastly, as a couple of commenters have said, I want to emphasize how when two thirds of cannabis sales or two thirds or more are occurring outside the regulated market, um, this is only the beginning of the amount of data, the amount of pressure that we placed on this tech system. And, uh, and additionally, I, I offer concern that the recent decreases in data and decreases in calls um, may simply be attributed to cycles in the harvest um, and such, as opposed to actual true decreases that we could see another surge in November and beyond. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from an individual identified as Lisa. I am not showing an audio connection at this time. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on your audio and visual or your audio and video at the top of your screen and use the call in feature to connect. We will circle back to you. Our next public comment comes from Angelo Bella. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hi, yeah, I think I my question probably doesn't pertain to what the uh, the moderators and the, the presentation was about. So I'll pass. Thank you very much, though. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Joanna Cedar. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank, Thank you, you, Joanna Cedar here. I'm a consultant working with all parts of the supply chain. I've also owned and operated a software company since 1999. It's my professional opinion that metric, metric has always been bad for California. Um, we've talked about waste of plant tags um, and that the pay that the uh, that the state has to um, has to pay. Um, in fact, the contract that metric has with the state is heavily weighted um, in metrics interest for the sale of plant tags. Um, there's always been dysfunction in the system in rural areas. Um, and as a result, it incentivizes monocropping and indoor cultivation, which has environmental impacts. Um, a software company from Florida should not be incentivizing environmental impacts in the state of California. Um, the full and functional API does not exist. I don't think seconds. metric is capable of fixing these problems. Um, and I think that the state should look seriously into declining the renewal um, of that contract in June. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Max Estel. Your microphone will be unmuted shortly.
actually working. Um, we have a system that largely or, or, or frequently does not work. Pardon? Is this Max? Yes, it is. Hello. Go ahead. Your time starts now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is Max uh, as Dale with Meadow. Um, I, I just wanted to suggest that we need a focus group that isn't, you know, national. Uh, right now, I think I believe the focus group is national. And it's not transparent. You know, we need a track and trace system that works. Uh, the state is spending millions of dollars on this. It needs, and, and we're all depending on it. it needs to be gotten right. Um, I would suggest that we need an API status page. Uh, too often, um, you know, the, the the API is down, and there's there's no way for the licensees or users to know that. Uh, so those those are my main comments. I would like an API, or we would like an API status page. Many of us. Uh, and we would also like uh, reform of the focus group so that it's uh, you know more transparent and and specific to the needs of California um, in, in order for it to scale successfully and, and provide the value that the state of California and the people of California are paying for. Thank you. At this time, it does not appear we have any additional requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Actually, it does appear we may have one additional request for public comment. An individual identified as Blaine. And it appears he has just dropped off the call. So there are no additional requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? If we have no additional comments, yes, please. This feature has been closed. So uh, we've had some very good public comment. We had a great presentation by CDFA and, and uh, Mr. Koski from uh, Metric, is there any additional comments from our committee members? And if not, we will move on to the next agenda item. Um, I see the hands of committee member you. Committee member you, you're being recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Member you here, though CDFA has made substantial progress with metric based on the feedback we are hearing, there still remains an ongoing need to improve upon the system. So I would like to bring forward a motion for the committee to consider to convene a subcommittee within the CAC to make recommendations for the full committee to address any operational challenges in the metric track and trace system. Um, from one moment, please. I'm trying to get some clarification from legal. So one, do we have a second on that? I do not see a second or hear a second. Do I have a second on committee yes. member use? Could you please repeat the motion? I apologize. Um, I did not hear it in full. This is member Navidal. Yes, the motion was to convene a subcommittee within sure, the- Sure, I'll do it to the first meeting of yeah. next year. Sorry, should I go ahead? Mr. Chair. Excuse me. So, um, could you repeat the question? Do you remember you? Yes. The only the, part of your response. The motion was to convene a subcommittee within the CAC to address any operational challenges in the metric track and trace system. And you, we have a second? Committee member Nevidal will second the motion, please. Thank you, sorry, I was having some technical difficulty. Um, 
So having a motion and a second, are there any other comments from committee members? I see the hand up from committee member Stevenson. Is it related to this issue? Seeing none, um, can you open this up to public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon lower, located in the lower right hand corner of your screen and type, I would like to make a public comment. We are currently taking all public comments for the, at the item currently being discussed. With that, our first request for public comment comes from Matt Mayberry. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hi, this is Matt Mayberry with TRIM. Uh, I'd like to uh, add that I'm also part of the integrator group that was referenced in the public comment period previously. Uh, I think the subcommittee is a great uh, a great motion, and uh, I'd, I'd ask that the subcommittee definitely take into consideration uh, inclusion of uh, API integrators in the conversation to ensure that those uh, those views are represented in the revisions that are made to the metric system. And uh, also, I think it would be uh, very, it would behoove the committee to also include uh, representatives from uh, operators throughout the supply chain within California. Our next public comment comes from an individual identified as Darren Story. Your microphone has been unmuted. Yeah, good morning again. Uh, my name is Darren Story, and I'm the CFO of Strong Agronomy. We're a cultivator in Southern Santa Cruz County. Our nursery is the largest uh, nursery by volume, and it was confirmed uh, this past week for when we had our inspection from CDFA metric that we do actually affect the most transfers of any cultivator in the state. Uh, so to put it bluntly, we know full well the painful limitations of metric. We don't um, do API. We have several systems engineers on staff that work directly on the metric platform. Uh, this subcommittee is a great idea. I say we get it going. Um, we really enjoy the chance to work with the subcommittee. Um, we have working solutions um, that may or may not include metric, but they do include CCTT and uh, we can do a much better job than what we have right now. And we need to be, remain competitive with the illicit operators. And um, under the current state, that's not gonna happen. So thanks, 30 for seconds. Considering, thanks for considering this option. That's it. Our next public comment comes from Jennifer Gayarani. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you. Um, I would like to make this comment on behalf of the California Distribution Association. We are very happy to hear this motion for a subcommittee focused on metric. And I will repeat the previous comments that we need to make sure that the conversations in the committee subcommittee work is focused around not only operator issues and the user interface side, but also this API integration side. Um, CDA invites any of the subcommittee members to to our quote unquote house where we have um, a industry wide and collective relationship with many other trade associations that are ready and willing to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Max Estel. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, support the motion for a metric uh, uh, subcommittee um, for the advisory committee. Thank you. Next, we have an individual identified as Max Mikulanis. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hi, uh, good morning, Max McGlonis. I uh, just wanted to support the motion. I think it's critical that these metric issues be subject to ongoing discussion review by the CAC um, and ongoing discussion with the regulators and such. So I 
strongly urge the committee to adopt this motion. Thank you. Next is Eddie Franco. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you so much, committee members. Um, just want to echo and be in unison with previous comments in full support of this motion. Um, also want to echo the sentiment um, in previous comments that if there can be emphasis made for a direct industry participation and stakeholder engagement, um, that would be the best route. Thanks so much. Michael Wheeler, your microphone has been unmuted. Good morning, committee members. Michael Wheeler, uh, Flow Cannabis Company. Uh, strong support for the motion and uh, echoing uh, the comments of Eddie Franco that it is important to have uh, the engagement uh, of the, the industry also participate in this kind of feedback opportunity. Much appreciated. Paul Hansbury, your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, good morning, everyone. This is Susan Tibben. Paul Hansberry and Susan Tibben are sharing the same computer this morning. Um, I will be commenting on the motion um, rather than Paul. Um, we are by no means the largest operator in California or our county. Uh, we are quite small. Uh, there are many people like us. Um, we'd like a track and trace system that's easy to use. Um, we don't have the resources to hire outside entities to help us manage a completely dysfunctional track and trace. So I support putting together a working group, but I'd like the working group to look closely at whether this is the right fit for California. Thank you very much. At this time, we have no additional requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, moderator. Feature has been closed. So let me just remind um, folks, we did take a motion in a second and we could put this for a vote. I don't know that it's necessary unless there's some committee member that feels really strongly about opposing the idea of a subcommittee. You know, we can, um, I can, kind of mandate one or, you know, point one um, from where I'm at. And I do think it's it's important that we do have a subcommittee um, meeting on this topic so we can get give more time uh, to the issues that are being raised by uh, members of the public, as well as individuals from the committee who may have a direct relationship with using the track and trace interface. I just uh, believe that the soonest we could do this would be the first first meeting of the 2021 year. And so um, with that, that would be my recommendation, unless I have some committee member that wishes to uh, speak in opposition to, to doing this. Um, thank you, Farrah. This is uh, committee member Lynch. Just in the interest of being consistent with how we've formed subcommittees in the past, I think we should take a vote. I don't have any opposition per se, but I just think for purposes of, you know, procedure and how we've operated in the past um, and to not seem biased uh, for this particular recommendation, we should take a vote. Well, that's fine with me. I know that uh, it's been done both ways, but um, yeah, so let's, let's take the vote. So call the roll. So the motion is to convene a subcommittee to address operational challenges in the metric track and trace system. With that, I will go to committee member Baboyan. Aye. Committee member Cermak. Aye. Committee chair Farrow. Aye. Vice chair Heidelbeck. Aye. Committee member Lynch. Aye. Committee member Nevdal. Aye. Committee member Peck. Aye. Committee member Ron. Aye. Committee member Stevenson. Aye. Committee member Woolsey. Aye. Committee member Wu. Aye. Committee member Yu. Aye. Motion passes. So 
Um, along with this, are there any, by a show of hands, can I get uh, which committee members would be interested in being on this committee? So I see the showing of hands from committee member Nevidal, committee member Woolsey, committee member Yu, committee member Heidelbach, committee, committee member Babulian. Very good. Thank you for your interest. Uh, with that, um, we can close this and we will schedule the um, dates and the committee members and our vice chair can select the chair for that uh, committee. Thank you. With that, we'll be moving on to the next agenda item, which is agenda item five, a discussion and possible action on recommendations related to permissible ingredients for inhaled cannabis products. I see a hand from a committee member, Mr. Cermak. I'd like to, this is committee member Cermak. I'd like to uh, request that we switch this uh, agenda item with uh, the following agenda item. Um, one on potency, I think, is going to be um, something that we can probably dispense with a little bit sooner, and uh, I prefer doing that one first, if we can. That would be fine, committee member Cermak. So, jumping to agenda item number six, uh, it will become agenda item number five, and agenda item number five will become agenda item number six. Um, that said, the uh, next agenda item will be a discussion and possible action of recommendations related to the impacts of high THC consumption research. Uh, let me remind everybody that there was a motion second and uh, passage of a similar motion at our meeting last year, or last uh, month, excuse me, time flies when you're having fun. Um, the reason for putting this back on the agenda is that between the time our agenda had been created and our meeting, there had been some guidance from the AG's office on a way to clarify that there would be action taking on such a motion, though we believe that is fine to uh, address the concerns raised by a particular community member or stakeholder, we've decided that we would re-agendize this item. To be able to move forward with that though, I would need to have a rescission of the motion and second from the last meeting. And I would read what the motion was that was approved last meeting and I would seek a motion in the second for that. Uh, the motion from last meeting was I move to rescind uh, the way it would be structured is I move to rescind the recommendation adopted on September 25th that CDPH requests and supports the Office of the President of the University of California to convene an expert scientific task force exempt from conflicts of interest to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency THC content of cannabis and cannabis products and the state of the science on health implications of increasing potency, for example, but without limitation upon dependency, mental health, health benefits, and drug driving, present a summary of the scientific data and make public health recommendations to cannabis regulatory agencies and to the public. So with that, um, you see that recommendation that was adopted could i get somebody or the the uh, motioner and the second to rescind that um, motion this is chair sir mac and i move to rescind that motion thank you and our second Uh, Committee Member Lynch, this was your second. Do we can we get you to rescind that motion? Yes, rescinded. Thank you. 
So we have a rescinded motion and now we can move forward with the discussion and possible action on the recommendation. Excuse me, since, since it was a motion and a second to rescind, can we, uh, first, I believe we have to have public comment on the rescission. Am I correct? So since there's a, been a motion and a second before we could have a vote of the committee to rescind this, can we have public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the Q&A icon located in the lower right hand corner of your screen and type, I would like to make a comment. I will take all requests for public comment in the order they are received. I will pause a moment to allow individuals time to access this feature. An individual identified as Eddie Franco, your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, committee members. Um, Eddie Franco with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Point of clarification, just to ensure that I'm being germane with my comments. Is this a public? Is this our public comment for all of Agenda Item Six, or are we specifically just commenting on the rescinded motion? This is the BCC co-moderator. This is just public comment on the motion to rescind the recommendation that was adopted. Thank you so much, moderator. Uh, CCIA supports the rescinded motion. Thanks so much. Rand Martin, your microphone has been unmuted. Mr. Chair, members, Rand Martin on behalf of Kaliba. Um, we appreciate your uh, taking this action today. Um, we think this will give the uh, public a better opportunity to, to comment on this very important issue. Um, so we support the uh, rescission. Thank you. There are no additional requests for public comment. I take that back. Lynn Silver, your microphone has been unmuted. Um, thank you very much. Lynn Silver, the Public Health Institute. Um, I've been participating in these meetings for a very long time and never seen this happen. So I just hope that this is strictly an opportunity to repass this motion that passed unanimously last month with due public comment um, and is so important. And I'll comment again on the reintroduced motion. Thank you. At this time, there are no additional requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please, moderator. Feature has been closed. So before we start the uh, reconsideration of the agenda item, uh, I'd like to take a short break. We've been going for two hours and it's probably time for us to take a short break in order for po folks to uh, make calls or use the facilities. So uh, we will readjourn in 10 minutes in order to address um, agenda item five. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, where we left off is we had had uh, a motion in the second or rescinding of a motion in the second. We had public comment. And with that, I'd like to open it up to the committee for a vote. So can we take the roll on the motion in second? Point of order. Yes, Dr. Cermak. Uh, this is Chair Sir, or Chair, Committee Sir, Member Cermak. I'm, uh, I just want to clarify that this is a parliamentary procedure, this rescission, and that immediately after that, we will have, I will have an opportunity to present this uh, motion on behalf of the subcommittee and uh, public health and youth. Is that correct? That is correct. Did that answer your question, Dr. Cermak? Uh, Yes, it did completely. Thank you very much. We can very go ahead good. and vote now. Very good. So, with that, uh, 
So moderator, could you please call the roll? Yes, so this motion is to rescind the adopted motion that was uh, from prior meeting. So with that, I will go to Bobulian. Aye. Sir Max. Aye. Clifford. Uh, good morning, everyone, and aye. Sarah. Aye. aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevdal. Aye. Peck. Committee member Peck. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Stevenson. Stevenson here. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. You. Aye. And Stevenson, you said here, but I did not hear a vote. So can you unmute? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. So um, we are going to now open up discussion for agenda item five, which was the discussion and possible action on recommendations related to impacts of high THC consumption research. So with that, uh, I'll open it up to discussion from the committee. Is there any discussion related to agenda item number? It was number six, it is now number five. I think Dr. Shermack, you had talked about wanting to re-raise a motion on this agenda item. Do you wish to do so? Moderator, could you open the microphone for Dr. Shermack? Thank you. Dr. Shermack, can you hear me? Thank, thank you so much. I was running into a technical problem here. So I understand that um, there was a legitimate uh, objection to the uh, agendizing of this motion uh, at the previous meeting uh, with the not saying that it was um, going to, there was possible action that was going to be presented and for possible action. So that uh, agenda has been corrected this time. It was a unanimous vote last time. There were some, there have been some objections that I've heard, uh, one of them being the uh, dearth of, uh, of research that is available to investigate. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that um, if you are looking only at the uh, clinical uh, research literature, um, it's there's much more of a dearth there than there is in the basic science uh, literature. Um, and, and partly as a proof for that, um, I, we provided in the, um, in the material sent out from, from the public comment, um, the piece from uh, Rosalie Pakula, who, um, spoke in favor of this and then had a, a signing, a co-signing from, I believe, about 34 uh, other major um, researchers uh, around the world, all supporting this, uh, this, uh, this motion. Uh, there's also uh, a letter from uh, uh, Dr. Volan, who uh, in Oakland, who has treated over uh, she says 13,000 people with um, medicinal cannabis. And uh, she notes, uh, I think quite accurately, that with the sudden rise in, uh, in vaping, she has seen far more difficulties than she'd ever seen before uh, with very high potency um, THC. And she also supports this motion. So there's, there's um, plenty of support among the research community for being able to um, to review all of the scientific literature which is available, um, the uh, 
the other point, uh, let's see, the other point that I wanted to make was um, related to the idea that we should be doing the research rather than just reviewing the literature. And the, the beginning is always to be reviewing the literature. Uh, doing the research would mean, um, a, you know, a, a multi-year uh, process. And uh, we're really in a, a situation where we are per permitting um, very high potency THC to be um, legally retailed in, in California. And um, so I think that putting off a, a review of what is known and providing that to the regulatory agencies and to the public uh, as soon as possible, uh, putting that off is really, in a sense, ignoring uh, what could be uh, um, a difficulty that's developing within the uh, within our state. Um, there was also an objection that well, what we're not defining what high potency THC is, and perhaps we should be uh, looking at uh, multiple um, doses of of THC, multiple concentrations. But uh, I think that's uh, completely taken care of in in the motion as it's. Um, as it's presented, it would be up to the uh, the group of experts to be looking at, well, on the basis of impacts, what does represent uh, high potency? And we also talked about increasingly high potency. So I think that also is looking at the idea of there might be lesser impacts at a lower level, greater impacts at a greater level, and, and um, it's just providing the data so that those people who make regulations around this uh, can be working from that foundation. So with that, um, with those comments, I, I just want to uh, remove that, um, remove this motion. Should I be repeating the motion as it stands or can that just be read um, as, it, as it stands? Can you remember, Sir Mac? I would think it would be best if you read back into the record the okay. Uh, motion. Okay, very well. So I move um, CDPH request and support the office of the president of the University of California to convene an expert scientific task force exempt from conflicts of interest to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency uh, THC content of cannabis and cannabis products, the state of the science on health impact, health implications of increasing potency, for example, but not but without limitation upon dependency, mental health, drug driving, and health benefits. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the court reporter speaking. Yes. And I want to make sure I have this down, but you're breaking up and I don't know if anybody else is hearing that and it might be the papers by the mic. Oh, could be, could be. If um, you could, if you could, um, oh gosh. Uh, do you want me to start over again this evening. Yeah, why don't you read it so it's clean? Thank and you. I, I apologize for um, for the difficulty I have reading because of my visual. Committee so member Cermak, this is the uh, co-moderator. I have the motion. Would you like me to? Oh, please. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So the motion is moved to move that the office of the president of the University of California to convene an expert scientific task force exempt from conflicts of interest to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency THC content of cannabis and cannabis products and the state of the science on health implications of increasing potency, for example, but without limitation upon dependency, mental health, health benefits, and drug driving, and present a summary of the scientific data and make public health recommendations to cannabis regulatory agencies and to the public. 
Is that correct, Dr. Sarnat? Well, there was one part that was missing in the very beginning where it said, uh, I move CBPH request and support the office of the president. So that was just left out, I think, in what you said. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. I, I see uh, committee member Woolsey has his hand raised. Are you calling to make a second or do you have a comment that you'd like to make? I don't know why it's raised. I'll take it down, sorry. Okay. Do we have a second to the motion? This is committee member Lynch, I'll second the motion. Very good. I do know, do know that we um, have some comments from the Department of Public Health. And I don't know whether we could um, have that read into the um, agenda item for thought. Do you have a copy of that co-moderator? Okay, well, what we could do is we can open it up to public comment. And then um, if we have those comments from the CDPH, then we can add that before we move back to the committee for consideration. Okay. Uh, Member Nevidal would like to discuss the motion before we move to public comment, if possible. Okay, I didn't see your hand, Committee Member Nevidal. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Would you like to have a discussion? Yes, thank you, um, Chair Farrow. Um, this is Committee Member Nevidal, and I um, had asked a couple questions about the motion um, in the previous session, um, but still. Um, would like to ask a couple of questions. Um, first off, um, I the task force, um, would this be, I guess I don't really understand the, the term task force together, say a scientific panel, or is there kind of a intent that this would be an ongoing um, series of evaluations? Um, I'm just, I guess the question is about um, the intent for the temporary or more permanent nature of what this motion suggests. Um, and then I'll just go through a couple of questions I have. Um, I would really like to see the reference to health benefits move further into the earlier portion of the motion um, so that this motion um, to me feels a little pointed in assuming there's Kind of uh, mostly health impacts and harms that we need to be looking for, and I, I would greatly appreciate equal consideration with benefits. Um, and then, um, I am wondering about the use of the word um, "present a summary of scientific data." Um, is this essentially as um, getting us a report that summarizes the data? Um, and then the recommendations would be included in this, or would this be potentially just a presentation that would come back? And who would that come back to? There is a reference to public engagement. So would this come back to the CAC potentially so that there could be public discussion about recommendations before um, regulatory change or considerations occur? I, I, you know, the devil's in the details, so I just, was hoping for some clarity on those items. Dr. Shermack, I see your hand raised. Are you uh, prepared to make some comments to the questions posed by committee member Nevidal? Yes, I'd like to, to answer those. Um, this was uh, viewed not as an ongoing um, group, but um, to give a uh, state of the uh, state of the scientific literature as it exists at the point that the group is doing it. Um, 
there was a discussion last time about report. Someone didn't like that word. And so it was changed to a uh, summary, but it's intended to be a written uh, summary of what the data is and a written set of uh, recommendations uh, geared towards public health based on that data. Um, it um, was intended to be uh, provided to the regulatory agencies and also to be available to the public so it wouldn't be uh, hidden or sequestered in any way from the uh, from the general public being able to see uh, the findings of this group. Um, and there was one other one other thing that you said, oh, about um, the uh, the health benefits. I'm absolutely fine with moving that forward within that set of uh, parentheses. Uh, I'm just fine with moving that to to be the first one in that list of things. Uh, from a public health uh, point of view, I think it is uh, it, it does make sense that we're predominantly about any things that are going to be uh, harming the public health. Um, and the the idea of the uh, multiple ways that there could be health benefits is um, not really an issue that that public health generally needs to be too worried about or, or is concerned with. It attributes some to uh, a list that looked at the the possible um, harms to public health that can come from increasingly high THC potency. But I'm perfectly fine with moving uh, health benefits first within that set of parentheses. Committee member Lynch, are you fine with amending the motion to, and then let's, once we get an agreement that she would be fine, let's um, rephrase it or put it where it belongs so we have a clear motion. And then then what I would like to do is read the the uh, current law and the considerations again so everybody understands what's already being done. Thank you, um, committee member Lynch speaking. Um, first, I do um, agree with that change, but I'd actually like to speak to the motion as well. Um, so I think, um, I think it's important for us to remember that this committee um, looks at a whole bunch of um, issues which are to include public health and um, equity issues, which um, I think has other issues that have been raised. And I think um, that is in part as a result of the you know, loss of some committee members. And so I just feel it's very important that um, until we address the um, composition of the um, committee, which I think we did address at another time, that we really do remember um, our obligations uh, to consider um, the whole industry, including the public health and equity. And so I really um, would encourage us to have an open mind that something as simple as looking at potential both benefits and um, other, you know, concerning issues with high THC um, be reviewed by uh, independent um, and, uh, you know, credentialed uh, universities. So I would, you know, again, I, I recommend and uh, speak in support of the change, but I also want to speak um, strongly in favor of moving this motion um, from a public health perspective. Very good. I appreciate those comments, uh, Committee Member Lynch. Uh, Committee Member Nevidal, would you like to try to take a stab at how you see the uh, motion being phrased in a way that, that you could uh, see that there's equality between the benefits and the possible negative effects? Yes, and, and thank you. Um, this is Committee Member Nevidal, and um, thank you, Member Lynch and um, Member Cermak for your um, supported this motion, bringing it forward, and also um, openness to um, some changes. And just for clarity's sake, I um, a lot of the comments that we received um, have been focused on concerns with youth, but also some concerns with um, folks in the 21 to 25 age bracket, from what I've seen and largely in the adult use arena. And my concerns really are wanting to understand and make sure that we in no way do harm to 
um, the needs of patients, which I think are very different from um, adult use um, parameters. So this is um, maybe it would be most appropriate for me to um, clarify in this manner. So um, and as the motion gets into conversation, and I'll pick it up here. So to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency of THC content of cannabis and cannabis products and the state of the science on health implications. Could we please state it in this manner? And the state of the science on medical benefits and potential health implications of increasing potency. Um, then I think we could remove the health benefits out of the parentheses section of the motion. Um, and the reason for this is that I think health implications, public health implications, are, are very different from um, looking at the literature and the data out there to ensure that there are products on the market for patients that are tested and of appropriate potency for them to have their needs met. And so I, that is, um, that would fulfill my concerns or alleviate my concerns greatly if we could put medical benefits earlier in the um, motion. That would be amendable. Um, could could you read that? Are you, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Could, could you read that again so I could uh, hear it one more time? Would you like me to start from the beginning, or can I pick no. up? No, you can pick up where where you changed. So, to review the scientific literature on on, I'm sorry, on the medical. I'm sorry. Let me I, let me pick it up. I'm sure. Gonna like go back for just a minute. Um, okay. Yes. To review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency of THC content of the cannabis and cannabis products, and the state of the science on medical benefits and health implications of increasing potency. Um, and then in the, for example, but not limited to dependency, mental health and drug driving. Um, because the, the parentheses section seems to speak to the implications and the public health concerns, but I really wanna make sure that this research also considers patients needs. So I'm requesting that they look at the science on medical, benefits and potential health implications. Uh, I would be comfortable with that if you put the word potential in front of health benefits, the potential health benefits and the, or the potential medical benefits and health implications. So, and the state of science on the potential health benefit, I'm, I'm sorry, and the state of science on the on potential medical benefits and health implications of increasing potency. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, I am amenable to that. I would appreciate that and thank you. Yes. Does our court reporter feel that she has sufficient um, guidance on the amended motion for us to proceed? Yes. And does the second agree? Yes. Very good. So before we uh, go on to additional discussions, I think it's um, fair that I read to the committee uh, some of the information that we've been provided and considerations that, that have been provided by the Department of Public Health. Um, we didn't read into the agenda, agenda item six, and what was presented. There was that this agenda was previously considered on September in September of 2020. 
and is pending before the advisory committee for further discussions and possible action. On September 25th, the advisory committee considered recommendations related to impacts of high THC consumption research, a recommendation that was adopted by the advisory committee and public expressed a concern that the agenda did not clearly indicate that the advisory committee may take action on the agenda item of which we've all already covered today. Uh, the current law, which is under the tax and uh, revenue and tax code section 34019B uh, provides for research grants funding for public universities to conduct research related to the implementation of Proposition 64. Other research areas listed in section 34019B include public safety issues related to cannabis use, including studying the effectiveness of the packaging and labeling requirements and advertising and marketing restrictions contained in the act at preventing underage access to and use of cannabis and cannabis products and studying the health related effects among users of varying potency levels of cannabis and cannabis products. Grant funding recipients must report their findings and make a, reports available to the public. Uh, considerations for this motion and our further action is the Bureau is considering proposals from public universities to receive grant funding pursuant to tax revenue, uh, revenue and tax taxation code section 34019B and has 30 million to award in the process. The grant recipients are scheduled to be announced on November 6, 2020. The recommendation adopted by the advisory committee was that CDPH request and support the Office of the President of the University of California to convene, convene an expert scientific task force, exempt from conflicts of interest, to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasing high potency THC of cannabis and cannabis products. The state of uh, science, uh, which we've gone through this motion a few times here now says the state of science on health implications of increasing potency, for example, but without limitation upon dependency, mental health, drug driving and health benefits uh, presents a summary of the scientific data and makes public health recommendations to cannabis regulatory agencies and to the public transcripts of the discussion and oral public comments, as well as copies of the written public comments on this topic submitted for the September 2020 meeting are attached for consideration of this agenda item. So that's the guidance. We've had some additional modifications. I, I think the purposes of the CDBH notifying us of this, that there is already a process underway in which they're looking to tackle many of the issues that we have on this motion. And so with that, uh, I will open it up to final comments from our committee before we go to public comment. Committee member Fermack, did you have any additional yes. questions? Yes, I do. Thank you very much for calling on me. Um, I think that the um, research that um, CDPH is talking about being funded there will give us some uh, valuable data three or four years from now. And um, every bit of uh, good research begins with a good literature review. And uh, there's really no way of knowing whether or not whatever research they fund will actually provide uh, or actually speak to uh, the concern, which is uh, the core of this um, this motion. So I think it means that this this motion is an effort to get out in as far in front of things as we can so that we do get a chance to look at exactly what the data is today that we currently have so that regulatory agencies can take that into consideration in their deliberations rather than waiting three to four more years before they get the data that will come from that kind of research. As far as funding is concerned, I think that uh, when Lynn Silver from the Public Health Institute speaks, she can speak a little bit to what what funding may or may not be uh, available for um, for supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, 
uh, Committee Member Sermat. Committee Member Yu, I see that your hand is raised. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Member Yu here. Just wanted to reiterate that it's critical that we listen to science on this matter, and we do need unbiased evidence-based standards to determine what level is considered to be high THC to protect consumer health and safety. I would acknowledge that there isn't a large body of existing research and support the need for more research to be done. My hope is that um, any resulting summary doesn't lead to unintended consequences like stigmatizing the use of legal cannabis or lead to any punitive policies. And we do have many products on the market and it's important to learn more about the health related effects for adult use or small use. Would also quickly want to echo my member Nevidal's comments on potential me medical benefits here. There are many Californians who use cannabis for medicinal purposes, and some use high THC products, possibly to alleviate pain, lessen their symptoms, and for therapeutic needs. Though some of the challenges may arise from the subjective nature of the effects of THC, I think this aspect of use should be thoroughly researched. So glad this is in the motion. And just want to end by saying fully support efforts to help educate and inform consumers and support this motion. Thank you, committee member Yu. Committee member Ron, I see that your hand is raised. You can unmute yourself. Oh, hi. Uh, good morning. I just uh, wanted to echo some of the comments made by uh, um, Dr. Cermak and uh, Ms. Yu. Uh, agree wholeheartedly with the uh, with the initiative, um, the uh, importance of, you know, the initial data collection, literature review, and so forth, uh, like Dr. Sermak said, that's that's always phase one. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to get the, the data and, and have some, some good science behind uh, the issue. So uh, uh, glad to see that this is moving forward. Thank you. Um, thank you. Committee member Ron, uh, you can lower your hand. My my only, uh, this is committee member Farrow, Chairman Farrow. Uh, my only um, reservation in the way the motion is written, I do generally believe with um, committee member Cermak that these uh, research projects can take quite some time. But I also don't want to uh, hold up any findings. If we're going to be getting, though it's not public yet, and it's probably for good reason that we had these uh, RFPs submitted to the state for this grant funding, we don't know what the commitments to the state are or the total scope of the research. And the last thing I'd want to do is have to wait for something to come back from the, the university president when we might actually be able to secure data sooner um, and I also don't want to have duplication necessarily if the same type of panels are seated for this research so I mean I totally support I think more information is better but if we if we have some RFPs that are going to be coming out publicly noticed on what they're going to be researching the, the kind of the scope of the research that's going to be done and how they're going to go about doing that research um, I'd like to find a way that we can incorporate uh, that research, and if there's a supplemental work that needs to be done by the, you know, the university president to, to seat a group of subject matter experts that they can, you know, improve and expand upon it, and not just duplicate it. And that that's my only concern. Um, I agree with all of the comments that we need this for, you know, we are. Need I remind everybody uh, under the Department of Consumer Affairs and patients and consumers fall clearly under that role and that we should be doing everything within our power to provide the best for those, whether that is uh, informing them of potential harms or discussing the possible benefits. And so um, that's my comment. And with that, uh, I will move to public comment. Thank you. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A feature for making public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the Q&A icon located in the lower right portion of your screen and type, I would like to make a public comment.
First up, we have an individual identified as Eddie Franco. Keep in mind, you will have a minute and a half to make your public comment and provided a 30 second warning. With that, Eddie Franco, your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you so much, committee members. Eddie Franco on behalf of the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, it is important that any research or report done on the physiological effects of cannabis be broad in its approach and wide reaching in its sources. Um, as mentioned here, considering the severe lack of peer reviewed research related to high THC cannabis, particularly in the US, we really urge that this recommendation accounts for the breadth of international studies and scientific literature that is based around high THC products and base any report or recommendations on this full wide reaching range of data. Moreover, I do want to urge that on top of considering physiological concerns, this research also considers socio socioeconomic impacts of potential uh, high THC bans or caps, um, possibly looking at other markets or other states where we've seen this and the effects on the increase or potential increase to the illicit market. Um, we have seen that in some cases, consumers who are of need of high THC will go to alternative methods to find it. And we don't wanna see repeats like we did last fall with the VAPI nice. crisis. So just very important that we're considering the, the full range of cost and benefit, um, including individual health, as well as wider public socioeconomic impact that potential high THC uh, bans or caps could lead to. Um, thanks so much. Next, we have Joe Eberstein. Your microphone has been unmuted. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Joe Eberstein with the San Diego County Marijuana Prevention Initiative. Um, I support this, but no matter what this group decides, I think we can all agree that until you get a handle on the black market, unregulated pop products, regardless of potency, pose a public health issue and continue to put a black eye on the industry. I recently had a conversation with licensed dispensary owner along with a local emergency room doctor about health effects related to high potency pot products. We were told we don't have enough data regarding the harms, even though she shared her daily experience with patients coming in for various marijuana related health issues like psychosis, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, respiratory issues and accidents. I also shared our public health data showing 29 emergency room visits a day related to marijuana in the county and a 180% increase in poison control calls since legalization. They advised us that best-selling product was 86% THC, which is an enormous amount. More research is great, but there, there are several medical association, research institutions, and the Surgeon General himself that have made statements about the harmful effects of marijuana. There should be no doubt that potent marijuana is harmful. Thank you. Next, we have Rand Martin. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Rand Martin on behalf of Kaliba. To be clear, we're not opposed to research. We think research along these lines is absolutely necessary. We are opposed to doing a lit review. Uh, we think there's limited value when there is not much literature, literature to review. Um, that concern is amplified by comments that were made previously um, by the maker of the motion um, about the urgency of the situation now and why a lit review now would be helpful to provide information to regulators. That suggests to us that those regulations could be changed um, to reflect the um, limited uh, data already available and potentially affect how this industry operates, um, but not based on sufficient um, empirical data to justify that. I just wanna point out um, that uh, that the people who have been involved in potency research over the last year also say that there is not enough research out there. Robin Murray of the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College said current evidence on the incidence of psychosis relative to cannabis is pathetic. Dr. Bo Gilmer from Rand Drug Policy sure. Research Center in his presentation on po uh, potency talked about the paucity of, of data. Um, the researchers at the University of Bristol who did a report released in May, to date, no studies have described the association between cannabis potency and concurrent mental health in a general population study. Um, Dr. Kent Hutchison from the University of Colorado Boulder on their um, uh, study on potency said that the study raises questions that future re research will need to address. 
Um, those are the people who are doing the research now. Time had been reached. Um, Sarah Armstrong, I do see that you have made a request for public comment, but I also see that you do not have audio connected. If you would like to call in, if you click at the top of your screen where it says audio and video, you can get a call in number. If you could please call in and we would be more than happy to take your public comment. So we will circle back to you. Next, we have Stella Chow. Your microphone has been unmuted. Um, hi, my name is Stella Chow, Alcohol and Other Drugs Prevention Coordinator in San Mateo County Health System. I support a scientific task force with content experts who inform the advisory committee after reviewing data from scientific communities. Products and ingestion methods are constantly changing, so an ongoing task force is suggested to monitor arising health effects. To make decisions without sound data puts the health of our communities and children at risk. We need to keep talking about making data-informed decisions so that more support for data-informed decisions is rallied and possibly more funding for the future. Thank you. Next, we have Jason Sarush. Your microphone has been unmuted. Members of the committee, my name is Jason Sarush from the Public Health Institute. I am commenting in full support of this motion as stated. There is no downside to reviewing existing peer-reviewed scientific literature. And understanding the research is a fundamental step to ensure that California's cannabis policies are evidence-based. I think most of us know cannabis does have many health benefits, but currently product diversification is occurring at an alarming rate with no guardrails preventing concentrated and purified cannabis extracts from being produced for human consumption. It is the responsibility of California regulators to ensure that the cannabis products available to consumers are safe by reviewing the best information available. I think we can all agree that anything sold for human consumption should be proven to be safe through research, but at a minimum, health and regulatory officials should confirm there is no scientific literature identifying potential health risks. Having said that, I hope cannabis industry stakeholders stakeholders would agree with public health advocates and support assembling this task force to review the scientific evidence without any specific agenda other than making sure they're familiar other than making sure that they're familiar with the existing body of literature. So again, thank you for your time. Next, we have Gilbert Mora. Your microphone has been unmuted. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name oh. Wait, it's still morning. Uh, my name is Gilbert Mora. Uh, I am a public health professional in Southern California. And, you know, I'm not really understanding the opposition to this motion. Uh, if anybody understands science at all, they understand that lit reviews answer many questions. Number one, what what is the issue? Number two, where do we need to go next? And number three, is there more in-depth research needed? Everybody's claiming that there's not enough out there. Okay, there's not enough out there. This lit review will expose that and it tell us where we need to go in the next step. So all this bluster about, oh, it's gonna be biased, it's gonna be this, it's gonna be that, we won't know until it's done. So stop using the scare tactics to, kind of 30 seconds defer us from actually using science for the way science is supposed to be used it just it feels disingenuous when people are discounting the literature before it's even reviewed so that that is my comment and public health is about finding answers not about you know supposing what might or might not happen thank you Karen Woodson, your microphone has been unmuted. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Karen Woodson on behalf of the Flow Cannabis Company. Uh, we, we sincerely appreciate Dr. Saramac's attention to public health um, and uh, committee member Nevidal's uh, amendments to the motion. Uh, public health is obviously one of the justifications for a regulated market and health outcomes within the regulated market should be better than the status quo. But I want to take this opportunity to remind the committee that the status quo in California is the unregulated market, where the vast majority of cannabis sales and products are produced and sold. High THC cannabis products are an interesting topic to study, and thanks to funding at the state level, more research is being done. 
FCC can support the lit review and research about impacts on high THC consumption, but would advise the committee um, to support or amend the motion further to explore the public health outcomes resulting from uh, what happens when the cannabis market uh, is being unregulated. A study should pay special attention to the dynamics of the regulated cannabis market competing with the larger unregulated market and determine what types of reform would provide the most advantage to expanding the legal market. After all, the greatest public health improvement regarding the $10, $10 billion cannabis industry in California would be to have it be occurring in the regulated market. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah Armstrong. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Americans for Safe Act, Director of Industry for Americans for Safe Acts. Founded in 2002, we are the nation's oldest and largest advocacy organization for medical cannabis patients. I urge this honorable committee to include doctors who make a specialization in treating medical cannabis patients. Right there in Berkeley, you have Frank Lucido who's been doing this for a number of years. Some of these doctors have been specializing in medical cannabis for a quarter of a century, nearly a quarter of a century, 24 years. They should be included in any study on potency. Additionally, the state of California has already recognized that patients may need higher dosages. Patients may acquire more medication than a recreational user. And I hope that the committee will also move aggressively to make sure that nothing they do takes Excuse. away the right of the sick and dying to access as much medical cannabis they need and in any form they need. Thank you for your time and attention. Next, we have Jackie Subek. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you. Thank you to the committee. Uh, good, good morning. Um, I, I, I support always further scientific research, and I agree with the comments about uh, fair representation of both sides of the health impacts and the health benefits. But I wanted to bring up something that I don't think anyone's talked about yet today, which is this concept of the giving this grant over this money over to the UC president to make that decision as to who become who are members of the expert scientific task force. Right now, there's a UCLA cannabis research initiative, which is a program that happens at UCLA. And to be honest, they've uh, some of the um, panels and things that they've had have really shown some substantiated, uh, unsubstantiated evidence, making some fairly dubious uh, claims uh, to the negative health you know, impacts of cannabis and of THC, and they don't present the health benefits. So I think that it's really important, and I wanted to just sort of throw this out there, is it possible for uh, for the, com the committee to even have oversight into who the members of the scientific task force are? Um, I think it's important that we do have both sides or all sides on at the table um, and not have a skewed perspective. So thank you very much. Paul Hansbury, your microphone has been unmuted. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Chair and committee members. Um, sometimes the research that's out there is, is flawed. Um, the, D, the NIDA and the DEA would only grant research uh, licenses for people that were looking for the harm that uh, cannabis would do. So there's lots of information, scientific information and peer studies that, that are flawed in, um, in their uh, conclusions. Uh, for instance, there's a problem with the definition of impairment. I believe that in this motion, we're calling it drugged driving. And there are some studies that show that it actually improves dr their driving. There's some that says that there's none, there's no change, and, and some that says that they're impaired. So getting the definition of impaired. Also in Washington state, they included with their legalization a per se DUI, which tests for metabolites, which stay in the cells, in the fat cells of human beings for up to 71 days. 
Um, and uh, but still, instead of getting a, a, a misdemeanor possession charge, they're getting charged with a DUI because of the way that they're testing it. So the the information and the research that's out there is can be flawed, and that's that's a slippery slope right now. Before there's more research getting done, so the lit review that you're requesting uh, needs to be more uh, towards the the potential. Um, um, the, as Ms. Nevidal said, the, the health benefits and potential implications. Time had been reached. Next, we have Andreas Ramirez. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Andres Ramirez on behalf of Cresco Labs. Uh, as it relates to THC potency levels, wanted to echo some of the comments of my colleagues before me. It's important to ensure that any recommendations made and any subsequent health information made public is based on a wide range of studies from diverse populations and sizable samples. Um, current literature on the effects of THC at various levels of potency is far from abundant, uh, and much of it has been based internationally. Additionally, we urge the committee to revisit monetary allocations after the general election as we will hopefully then have a better idea of what the future of federal cannabis research and funding will look like. Thank you. Next, we have William Perno. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you. Good morning, William Perno with the Central Region Prevention Coalition. Uh, I agree with Dr. Surmack, and I think it's critical that the motion stated that there were to be no conflicts of interest uh, and that should be something that you consider before you start looking at committee appointments onto this uh, committee. Um, there are med medicinal uses for cannabis and there are recreational uses. Youth access, the number one reason for youth in county funded drug treatment in San Diego County is from marijuana. As uh, you've heard from other speakers, emergency room visits are up with chest pain, psychosis, cannabinoid hyperemesis and others. In the 1980s, THC was at three to 4%. Now it's up to 99% THC. Uh, the government research that's been done on many of the studies and research to date was limited with uh, marijuana grown at the University of Mississippi, capped at 12 to 13% THC. And these products that are on the shelf now for sale have no research or any studies on them. Is, is that higher potency THC causing harm? That's 30 the, seconds. That's a question that needs to be answered. We don't have good research and we need to know whether or not that is causing health impacts. Look at the science and data. Uh, there are other products in the marijuana plant though that you also need to be aware of, including uh, THCV like Victor, tetrahydrocannabinol. that's uh, psychoactive, perhaps even more so than THC. It is a euphoric high often described as psychedelic. So when you're doing research on these psychoactive components, please make sure you're doing it on all of them so you don't have people switching simply to another product that's not included in any um, Time had been reached. Next, we have Casey Strang. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I do support the motion. Um, it's important to note that just last week, the American Society of Addiction Medicine released a public statement saying that there is a need to limit marijuana potency because of the growing evidence of known adverse health impacts like cannabis, hyperemesis syndrome, psychosis, psychotic disorder, depression, respiratory symptoms and illnesses, cardiovascular symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, psycho, psychomotor performance, acute cannabis poisonings and addiction. The science continues to grow, showing the harms to public health and safety due to the high potency marijuana products. And really, most importantly, the serious negative effects of high THC products have on the developing adolescent brain. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly McCormick. Your microphone has been unmuted. Hello, this is Kelly McCormick and I'm the parent of two teenagers and I follow this situation closely. And I support more study and also point out that there has been study on the problems of high potency marijuana in the Netherlands, where there are limits on the amount of THC in retail products. The study was conducted over 16 years, during which time potency increased, along with the number of people seeking treatment for marijuana-related problems. 
When potency declined, so did treatment admissions. The researchers estimated that for every 3% increase in THC, the number of people seeking treatment for marijuana use disorder increased. Thank you. Next, we have an individual identified as Lynn Silver. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you, Lynn Silver, Dr. Lynn Silver, the Public Health Institute. Uh, first, I want to express my appreciation to the panel um, and its members, uh, both from industry and not from industry, for this idea, um, which is extremely important. Um, there is no question that the potency and composition of products will have some of the most important long-term impact on the safety of this market and how it affects human health, both for ill and for, uh, for good. Um, and I appreciate your understanding and support for that. Um, at least two other states, Washington and Colorado, have similarly concluded on the necessity to review the literature on this issue to inform their public policy. Um, those reports have not been issued yet and are underway. Uh, there is extensive scientific literature on this issue, but it continues to grow, and the rapidly changing market uh, creates ongoing challenges. I would clarify in response to the comments from the Department of Public Health that this uh, proposal from Dr. Chermak is completely distinct from the also valuable research seconds. being supported by the uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control's RFP uh, to distribute the mandated $10 million in cannabis policy research funding. That will generate de novo research that will be important and contribute to the larger body of research, but only a few studies um, at a time, which will take three years, and which will complement the larger body of work. I believe that this work can be appropriately funded by regulatory funding to inform policy. And I do know that the Office of the President, which has extensive experience in organizing these types of activities. Time had been reached. Next, we have an individual identified as Max Michelonis. Your microphone has been unmuted. Good afternoon, uh, Max McAlonis, to echo a few comments. I am not opposed to the motion, but based on the public comments, it appears the proponents have already concluded there are negative health impacts. Should the next step following this study be to ban high potency products that ha would have a dramatic impact on the regulated market and fuel demand in the unlicensed market? So long as the unlicensed market it composes a full two thirds of cannabis sales in the state, that market poses dramatic existing public health risks to consumers. Those products may have dangerous ingredients, unsafe levels of pesticides, or damaging effluent in their growing. Any moves to ban high potency products from the legal market would instead fuel those sales in the unlicensed market with all of the above associated health impacts on top of any health effects that are identified by the study. Furthermore, there are serious public safety impacts of moving high potency products to the unlicensed market as it will fuel demand for open blasting or the uncontained hydrocarbon extraction of cannabis using butane hash oil, which has caused numerous injuries and deaths throughout the state prior to licensing and regulation. So I am not opposed to the motion, but I'm urging consideration for the next steps and that they not be a limit or prohibition on high potency products because of the dangerous public health and public safety impacts of such a ban. Thank you. Next, we have Joanna Cedar. Your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you. I appreciate the idea of the motion, yet I do think that it's premature and forgive me, to be glib, the state should take its $30 million and lobby the federal government to allow full access to the wide range of cannabis products available on the market so that the research can be conducted. There's a disconnect between the product products this motion wants to study and the ability to access them for study. And the committee should understand the reason for the lack of peer reviewed scientific data that we'd like to look at. And those research institutions that are capable of this study cannot engage primarily because of federal regulatory restrictions that force all sorts of convoluted processes in order to get very substandard product from the University of Mississippi. So I would urge 
Um, or let's say, uh, let's say this, it is my hope that after the election, the research encompassing the entire range of products can truly commence. So I urge the committee to wait on this motion, table it for now and revisit it after January. Thank you. Kent Lesopraski, your microphone has been unmuted. You are Hello. unmuted, Kent. Hi, I'm just calling in. Uh, I'm a new applicant. Uh, I'm recently released after seven years of prison and new to all this committee and all this stuff that I was in. I was in the industry before and a cultivator and have recently, like I said, got out and I'm um, in the process right now of the verification and I'm just bringing up the speed. So I'm just involved in the workshop listening and bringing myself up to speed and getting the social equity and verification process, I'd like to get back into the industry. And uh, I'm just really just uh, listening. And uh, I've had a couple, you see my question, I started, I, I'm hearing on some of the comments. So that's that's my concern and public comment and is my point of view. Um, and listening to all your different uh, concerns and how it concerns me uh, from distant questions and how I can be involved or uh, from the metrics questions all the way up to the current questions and my part in the whole committee process and licensing um, and being able to come in and get a retail and uh, 15 seconds. So that was just my point. I'm just commenting and uh, putting myself out there and uh, listening. Thank you very much. Allison Padone, your microphone has been unmuted. Thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Elisa Payton. I'm a research scientist from the Public Health Institute. I just want to make it clear that a literature review means you review published research available from all years, from all countries, to not just look at the conclusions and take them for fact, but to review the quality of the studies and make an assessment on the strength of evidence that is out there. When strong evidence exists, it can be used to inform regulations. But when weak evidence exists, that literature review is how we will know how to improve future research efforts. For instance, research which the 30 million from the BCC could be directed towards. Thank you. At this time, we do not have any additional requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Please do, moderator. Thank you. Feature has been closed. And, and I'd like to thank the, the last speaker because that was one of the things that I thought was a reoccurring. And I, I noticed in the motion there was no discussion of where the scientific literature was going to be presented. I will tell you personally, in my other role in life, I've worked with several of the California state universities in their efforts to try to get from the federal government the right to be able to do scientific research, of which most of them are very challenged by that. And if you go back to the point that people made earlier on the metric, this is the largest market in the world. And it's very important that our local universities find a way to be able to do scientific research that can be peer reviewed and that can be published. Um, but I do believe this is a good start. I do believe that um, if we are able to take all of the existing literature that's been produced, whether that's from Israel or Europe or wherever, and be able to use that with some of the findings that have been able to be done by great um, public health and um, marijuana um, folks that have done research on marijuana in the U.S., um, then we should be able to have some idea of both the benefits and the potential hazards of, of this product. I don't know necessarily that, that these would uh, result in uh, banning of any product. That's not my decision to make, but I do know that it would be great to be able to provide consumers information on the potential harms of consumption as well as the benefits of consumption. So uh, with that, I'll open it up to 
uh, questions from our committee, and then um, if we have no questions, uh, a vote. So uh, I see committee member Nevidal and committee member Lynch. So why don't we start with committee member Nevidal? Sure, thank you, committee member Nevidal here. Um, so I, I do have some concerns about uh, finances um, and timelines on this. So um, it looks from the information presented on this item that on November 6th, the Bureau will be announcing the recipients of $30 million worth of grant funding. Um, arguably that is before our next meeting. Um, I did, listen to Ms. Silver's um, comments and um, proposing to allocate regulatory funding for the study um, it brings up great concerns for me. I mean, here we are um, in a situation where we are having, um, I would say, likely significant public health impacts due to the illicit market. Um, looking back on last year's annual report, um, the public health um, and youth prevention um, subcommittee did make a recommendation that the CAC supported um, to really look at um, how the Bureau is enforcing um, illicit activities and trying to get these products off of the market. So this has been um, a concern that has been noted by the CAC that there is um, a significant issue and health implications around um, the illicit marketplace. Um, allocating regulatory funding for research when there is research grants that will be announced next month. Um, when I think the large, I mean, it's my opinion that a large reason that we have such an extensive illicit market is that the pathways to entry into the legal market are so incredibly costly right now. Um, the timelines and the barriers associated with entering into the legal market are very extreme. Um, and so, um, at the very least, it seems like we are at great risk of potentially duplicating funds from different areas of either the Canvas Tax Fund and or the regulatory program itself. Um, when we could, and I hate to say this, um, kick this can down the road until the next meeting where we can be briefed as a committee on what research will be happening um, based on that $30 million and then make um, a, a more informed recommendation if necessary um, about whether or not we need some immediate literature um, um, assessed and there, I think there is probably the possibility that we could see research that is going to start with a lit review and then hopefully follow up with research. I don't know, but I would be remiss to kind of strap the state with additional funding requirements when there is this pool that is going to be announced next week. We're focused on consolidating and streamlining and reducing costs, not just for the legal supply chain, but for the licensing authorities in this program um, to be operated um, on the government level. So, um, <sighs> I'm, I'm going to leave that there. I don't know that I can support this. I would like to see it come back when we have more information. I feel a little bit like we're kind of throwing darts in the dark and we don't know what's coming down the pipe, research and or studies. Um, and that's really just a matter of weeks away that we'll have that information. Thank you, committee member Nevidal. I'd, I'd re remind everybody on, on our committee and also the public that we're an advisory committee. The discussions that take place here and the discussions by this committee inform the regulators uh, of the direction we think they should go. Uh, just because we may make a motion to uh, put this before the, the university president doesn't mean that that will ultimately be the place it will go, but it will inform the the regulators who are handing out these grants of some ideas if there is shortage shortcomings in the research that is being um, um, the RFP has been presented for where we might want to fill those gaps. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass this over to committee member Lynch for her comments. 
Yes, thank you, um, committee member Farrow. Um, you made one of them, which is, you know, this is a recommending body. Um, and so our action today on this is a recommendation. And I, I find myself continually troubled um, with repeated comments in support of public health um, and then comments, uh, you know, in favor of having the industry, you know, be on the committee or uh, con convoluting, you know, what this study is, which is not a study about the issues of um, the illicit market, which um, is definitely something that, um, you know, we all, I think, are grappling with trying to get a hold of, as well as obviously the department heads. But this motion is very clear, which is, we should be guided by science the same way we are with climate change or with vaccines or with other things. And I, I think it's troubling that when we're talking about recommending a study by uh, agency or university, that is not influenced by the industry that we are having such problems um, either accepting the results of those or thinking it's going to be bias or um, recommending that we kick the can down. This has been an issue that we have addressed as a committee um, multiple times. This is not the first time we're hearing it. And again, this is a recommendation. So I would strongly urge um, that if we do care about, you know, science and knowing the public health implications, that people vote in favor of this motion. Thank you, committee member. Um, could uh, it, Committee Member Babulian, would you like to speak to this? Yes, thank you. This is Committee Member Babulian. Um, while I'm generally um, in favor of uh, research, I do want to point out uh, some of the issues with lit review. The literature that's already out there is biased and it's flawed. A lot of it is tied to the war on drugs and is why cannabis has been illegal and prohibited and why we're dealing with all this prohibition and trying to create a regulated market. Literature review summarizes a lot of what's already out there. In this case, that's probably not going to be the most accurate uh, reflection of science. The quality of re research in this case is very crucial. When we talk about scientists and all that stuff, and I say this with all the respect in the world, scientists are usually some of the more closed-minded uh, people. It takes a lot to change their opinion and their mind. And a lot of it is when they go into research, they try to confirm what they already know as opposed to trying to find the new. Um, when there's a lot of opposition for cannabis doctors, well, doctors that are focused on cannabis for the past couple of years or however long they've been in it, that's also very troubling for me because up until recently, and this is relatively speaking, there hasn't been any research done on cannabis. Whatever research has been done has been biased. So when you've got doctors that are no different than doctors that have never uh, researched cannabis, and if you're trying to be opposed to doctors like that, those doctors don't represent the industry. They're medical professionals that happen to focus on cannabis and cannabis research and learning more about it. They're going to have the most ideas and most thoughts uh, on this issue. Also, whoever is on the committee needs to be, um, it just needs to include all the doctors that have specialized on this stuff. They have the uh, most insight and thought on the subject. Beyond this motion, there needs to be a focus on new research, not just reviewing literature literature that's based on old research. Uh, reviewing the old without attention to the new is just going to end up wasting a lot of money. Um, a really good state to look at is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania created uh, clinical registering licenses. One of my clients was successful in securing one of those licenses. It allows them to do research in partnership with the university. In this case, their research is going to be done in partnership with Penn State University. Stuff like that doesn't end up costing the state. It doesn't cost $30 million for a university to, uh, for the state to fund the university to just review old material that's out there. These are universities that are partnering with the uh, producers, cultivators to do actual research that's new research. So um, while again, while I'm all up for research and exploring this thing, we gotta be mindful of what direction this is going and are we trying to confirm some of the old stuff or are we actually looking at researching some of the new stuff? Thank you, committee, committee member Babulian, committee member Lynch. I see your hand came back up. Seeing your hand go down. Um, thank you for all the good comments by our uh, committee. Um, I appreciate that. I do think it's time for us to call the roll. Excuse can. me. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. This is committee member Cermak. I've tried to have my hand up during this. I'm sorry if it, if I didn't. That, 
That's all right, committee members. I, I have, I have uh, several comments. Um, one, um, I just uh, finished a, a book on the science of uh, marijuana for healthcare professionals. Um, over 500 references. They came from Israel, Italy, Spain, France, the Netherlands, England, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Hungary, uh, Australia. The, the literature around the world is, um, is free of all the restrictions uh, and most of the biases that people complain about exist within the literature that's produced in the United States. So uh, I, I think people really need to understand that the global literature uh, does not suffer from many of the problems that they see in the US literature. Secondly, I put nothing in this motion about funding um, purposefully. Uh, it would be up to CDPH and uh, University of California, uh, if, if the president, office of the president was interested in this, to be figuring out the funding. But I'd like to point out that I worked for over a year and a half on the Blue Ribbon Commission that the, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Governor Newsom uh, created, and which I think uh, helped pave the way for uh, Prop 64 and for its passage. I worked for a year and a half chairing the um, the youth work group. I did not get paid one penny for what I did. I wrote about a third of the final report that came out of, of the Blue Ribbon Commission. I didn't get paid one penny. So I, I think people need to understand that there are ways of doing this, which um, I, I think the the particularly the experts in the field would be willing to contribute to without necessarily expecting to make a lot of money. They're already being paid by their university salaries. So there are ways that this can be worked out that uh, I've left up to CDPH and, and the University of California. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I hope we can vote on it now. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shermack, for your comments and your service and all the stuff that all the committee members do voluntarily, although some of us in our daytime regular jobs were compensated for some of the work we do around this, but um, really do appreciate it. Many of you are here voluntarily that want to make this a better industry, that want to make sure that the people of the state of California are protected. So with that, I'm going to move on to the vote. Um, and so if you could call the roll, please. I'll look at the motion first just to make sure. So the motion is that CDPH requests and supports the Office of the President of the University of California to convene an expert scientific task force exempt from conflicts of interest to review the scientific literature on the issue of increasingly high potency THC content of cannabis and cannabis products and the state of the science on potential medical benefits and health implications of increasing potency for example, but without limitation upon dependency, mental health, and drug driving, and present a summary of the scientific data and make public health recommendations to cannabis regulatory agencies and to the public. And I would just ask committee member Cermak if that is the correct amended motion as I've read it. Yes, I believe that is. Thank you. Thank you. So moving to the vote, Babulian? Aye. Cermak? Aye. Clifford? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Heidelberg? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Heck? Heck. Ron? Stevenson? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. And you? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you for all the good comments and the time and effort put into this particular motion. With that, I think we are at time for lunch recess. We are gonna be on recess for 45 minutes. Um, so that should put us back at 1.15.